This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thank you, including Jeff Wilkes, Paley Glendale, and Dr. X17. Coming up on DTNS, one of the founders of Neural Networks has some serious concerns about the future of the models he helped create, but some of those models are helping doctors. Plus, can you be too afraid of public USB chargers? David, thanks for having me here. This is the Daily for Monday, May the 1st, International Labor Day 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Raffalino. And from the D.C. area, I am Chris Ashley. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. My friends and neighbors, it is good to be back in the saddle again. Uh, we uh, we got some 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 good news. We got some bad news, and we got some maybe it's good and bad news. So let's start with the quick hits. Arm disclosed a confidentially submitted draft F1 form to the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is its first step towards a U.S. stock market listing. They're going to finally IPO Arm. Uh, remember, NVIDIA wanted to buy Arm, but that fell through last year. So after that, SoftBank said it planned to take Arm public. Arm designs are, of course, used in just about every mobile device you can find on the market, including a bunch of laptops. Last month, Microsoft began rolling out chatbot integration into its SwiftKey Android keyboard. I mean, it's it's putting its chatbot in a lot of places, SwiftKey among them. And now it's coming to the uh, Galaxy. The SwiftKey team confirmed that the chatbot uh, is coming to SwiftKey on all current Samsung devices. It's integrated as part of the One UI, and it's the default. You can, of course, switch it, but it's on every Samsung device. So they're tailoring SwiftKey to Samsung? Uh, hard pass. Amazon's free ad-supported freebie streaming service will add more than 100 Amazon original series and movies from its Prime video service over the course of the year. In some instances, Amazon will not provide a full season of an original show on freebie, uh, just kind of a taste. And don't worry, the originals are staying on Prime video. So if you pay for Prime video or if you get it with your Prime subscription, those will stay there and they will be ad-free. CEO Elon Musk tweeted that in May, Twitter will allow media publishers to charge users on a per article basis with one click. He said the price would be higher per article versus, you know, if you just paid for a full subscription, but would still give you some access. More details are yet to come, including kind of major things like whether Twitter would take a commission or, you know, what kind of accounts would be able to offer the feature if they need to be verified, what badges they would need to have, all of that yet to come. Meta will hold its third annual Quest Gaming Showcase on June 1st, promising over 40 minutes of content related to new VR games. The stream starts at 12.45 Eastern on YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and inside the Horizon Worlds platform. All right, well, toot toot all aboard the AI generative hype train. It's still very much accelerating. We're seeing more of it Ticket, every please. single day. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Conductor Tom, for making sure we're all uh, registered here. But one of the things that we keep hearing about this technology, we hear about new models, use cases. That's kind of where this stuff is going to actually really start impacting our lives. One place they could make a big difference, the healthcare sector. And this isn't just idle speculation and kind of navel gazing. Doctors at UC San Diego Health and the University of Wisconsin Health have been testing GPT-3 integration since last month. So what are they using it for? Well, to generate drafts to a limited number of questions, uh, things like pulling in uh, 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 and that have the ability to pull in patient information. These often do require some editing, but they provide a good starting point most of the time, at least according to the reporting uh, that we've seen. There's also a new study in the journal JAMA Internal Medicine that took questions already answered by verified doctors on the subreddit Ask Docs and answered them using ChatGPT. So the chat GPT responses were compared to the human ones by a team of five medical professionals who didn't know which ones were machine generated. It was completely blind. They just generated the quality of those responses. And it's really important to note, it's, they were not submitted to the subreddit. Uh, they were just only used for the study. The study not only found more AI responses ranked well for quality, but interestingly, also for empathy compared to the human ones. So, you know, Chris, it's AI. It's health. Should this scare people? I, I, you know, often I find myself conflicted when we see some of these articles um, about the direction they're traveling in. However, 
this one is no different. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you fooled us. You fooled us. That's the swerve. So uh, while on one hand, I think everybody listening to this show has had somebody or themselves looked at WebMD and felt like they were dying. <laughs> like, oh, WebMD said it's over uh, at the same time. So, well, first, the fact that this can probably provide a much more intelligent answer and a much more streamlined answer uh, to common questions, as well as uh, help with the efficiency of getting answers from your doctors. I, I think that aspect of it is really, really cool. Um, but of course, on the other side of it is, you know, we find ourselves looking at our healthcare system more and more and seeing how it's a lot more profit motive in, in, embedded in there. And so you can't help but want hope that this is not the direction that they're using this for uh, to reduce the amount of doctors on hand, uh, but yet use it to be provide better answers and better services for people. So I, I am once again conflicted over this, but, you know, overall, so far, I, I like, I do like what I've seen as far as the study is concerned. As far as what I remember, uh, the healthcare sector has a shortage of workers. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, I'm not doubting that the profit is not a motive. Of course it would be, but uh, this is going to help fill in gaps in coverage because they don't have enough people too. So there's a, there's an upside there. Yeah, I, sure. I think it's worth pointing out that the study that used the Reddit stuff was just an evaluation to say, let's see if the responses are good. And it turned out to be better than they expected that isn't the same as like, now let's use them to treat people. It was more like, right. okay, now we know they're good. Let's figure out what we should use them for. Uh, and the San Diego and, and Wisconsin study is separate or, or a separate situation rather uh, is saying, let's use them for the non-medical stuff. Let's use them for, I, I need to fill out this form. Where do I get this form? Can I get my prescription renewed? You know, where do I get my prescription, et cetera. The, the stuff that is more procedural, which then would free doctors to actually spend more time treating patients. Yeah, that aspect I do like. Well, and one of the things that really stood out is like that the whole question of empathy, right? Because that is extraordinarily important uh, in, in any kind of uh, clinical setting, or at least the, the perception of empathy, right? Where we, we don't doubt that the doctor maybe, you know, wants our, our best medical outcome or something like that, but like the interaction feels rushed or, or for whatever like that. Obviously, this is just a first step to seeing how these tools can be used. But the Wall Street Journal had some interesting stats about like just just like what, what, what the medical field is kind of like when they're looking at, you know, kind of post pandemic, we're seeing like burnout of like 62% of, uh, of physicians. And this came from a, a Mayo Clinic uh, study. Um, and so like it's significantly up from kind of pre pandemic levels combined with more and more patients also like kind of looking to for electronic medical records using my chart and stuff like that queries are up like 60% uh, over the last couple of years. So those two things of we, you know, we even if given the same number of doctors available, more people kind of seeking these these quick answer to these questions. Chris, to your point, you know, WebMD kind of being the you know the the internet comment section of health that you know is just like <laughs> distressing hellscape, uh, and and actually getting reliable medical information like could be extraordinarily not just valuable in terms of time, but also for like health outcomes. And we're going to need a lot more of these studies to go like, okay, now we know that. Theoretically, these like we have one study that shows these theoretically can do this. The next step is to say, okay, like how can we design these so that we're not like generating? You know, yeah, what, what can you do with that? Right, the study isn't about the design. The study is about like, okay, it's worth something. Now everybody figure out what what it's good at, and that's what I like the Wisconsin uh, and San Diego health demonstrations. The way they described it was they get a message from one of their clients, one of their patients. Uh, and the chatbot would suggest a response based on the message that was using, uh, again, locally accessed health records. So there's no HIPAA violation. It's not going out on a network. It's the doctor that already has it. And the chatbot is running locally and says, like, based on this, this pa patient's history, here's what I would recommend telling them. The doctor shouldn't just press send and doesn't just press send. The doctor then looks at that and says, okay, this is a great draft. Let me uh, adapt it. But it's still faster. It's a it's, it's an aid in answering these messages. And I could see a better WebMD coming out of this where sure. WebMD is always going to show you every single 
disease, right? <laughs> like if you had one that's like, you probably don't have these because we know your medical history. I right. think that helps. Yeah. And I think that um, the, the, the aspect of this that I find somewhat exciting is, uh, you know, I did an interview with uh, Brandon Watson, a good friend of, my, of, of our podcast uh, yeah, yeah. a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things he talked about is how he's been programming against chat GPT to help with his interview at a uh, company. And essentially what he was finding was the AI was picking up nuances in the interviews that he was missing. Mm -hmm. um, so I could definitely see that sort of thing take place as well here where maybe a doctor missed something right. uh, in, in uh, what the patient is presenting to them, but the chat bot or the, the uh, AI can pick up on what they missed. So I, I would, as long as they kind of work these things in conjunction, doctor and AI, I, you know, I really like where this could potentially go and what the study is showing that it could do. And, and the other thing to think about is that the, the JAMA uh, study was looking at chat GPT the thing that you can log in and use mm -hmm, right now, this mm -hmm. very generalized tool. This is not something that was trained to be used in a medical setting. And that's what I, again, I think is exciting. Like ChatGPT, again, is the tech demo of all of this stuff. Yes, Extraordinarily right. powerful tech demo. But like when we can take this and say, we, we need this to, uh, we can, we know how like clinical encounters work. We have like tons of, of like cultural studies about like what leads to good health outcomes, what leads to people not telling doctors stuff. And we can build, like the idea is we could build very specific models to take those kind of things into account. We'll probably come up with all sorts of different other right, shortcomings cause, cause as well. Chat but, GPT is, yeah. is, 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 just, is like saying like, if it's any good at all, yeah. and that's what this thing found <laughs> yes. out. Like, oh, it actually is. Imagine if we tried to make the tool right. for this purpose. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. Let's move on to Ars Technica's Dan Gooden uh, has a nice piece on Ars Technica on the prevalence of juice jacking stories since the FBI issued its rather unusual uh, or rather usual uh, and unremarkable warning that it gives pretty much every year against charging over public USB ports. We passed it along because we thought, hey, this is a good reminder that those things can be compromised. Now, that warning isn't bad, or I wouldn't have said, let's put it in the show. It's not a bad warning. You should be wary of those ports. But every local news outlet in the U.S. jumped on it this time as a new trend, probably because the FCC issued their regular warning and the FBI tweeted it, and then the FCC saw everybody talking about the tweet, so the FCC <laughs> issued theirs again, and then the local news was all over it but it's not new nor is it a trend uh gooden points out that you probably don't need to worry about it unless you're a target of a nation state hacker uh there are no documented cases of juice jacking ever taking place in the wild they've taken place at defcon uh very famously to prove the concept but no one's caught anyone actually doing this out in an airport. Uh, most Android and iOS phones now warn if an external device wants to send you files or copy yours. That's because of the demos they did at DEF CON, which is why you do those demos at DEF CON to raise awareness about how to defend against these attacks. Uh, so what, what Dan was saying is like, sure, should you be wary? Yes. If you're down to 2% and you're in an airport and you only have your USB cable, should you not charge your phone? No, you're probably fine charging your phone. I look at this as the equivalent of like, yeah, if you've got an alternative to SMS for your second factor, use it because SMS isn't great. But if you don't have any other choice, SMS as a second factor is better than no second factor at all. Chris, what do you think about this? Is 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 the, the warning itself a bad idea? Well, it sounds like what Dan is saying is that your data is not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's that the risk is incredibly low because no one's ever done it. And Nobody you cares. probably won't be the target target the first time somebody tries. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, but on a more serious note, I, so I agree that uh, the likelihood of this happening to the regular person. Yeah, pro probably not so much because not only are they going to have to. Uh, hack the uh, the station where you plug into. They're gonna have to figure out how to make you plug into that station in the first place, unless they just want random people. But with that said, the one aspect of, that I do like that this is being reported and put out there is um, the ability to allow folks to stay on their toes. You know, oftentimes I I, I call people that listen to this show and other tech shows that they are the help desk for their uh, family members. And it's hard to keep them vigilant on protecting their data and their information. So when you have a story like this that kind of pops and people may come, may come across it, 
it, it, it does serve as a means for people to just not trust everything you do with your phone and with your computers and stuff like that. So for that perspective alone, I'm okay with mm. them probably overdoing it. Sort of the halo effect form. of it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, this for me is like, it's, it, it, it's about understanding your threat surface, right? Because it's like, if you try and account for like every possible vulnerability, you're either going to be like paralyzed by indecision, or you're going to be worried about something like this, which is an extremely low probability event and miss the phishing email that just landed. Like it, like it's, you know, you, you've got to be thinking about, okay, let's, let's guard against Tom to your point. Okay. SMS two factor authentication is flawed, still better than nothing. So it's like, okay, let's, let's take the most table stakes stuff out and the, the problem with these warnings is it can make, you know, when people that aren't necessarily tech savvy or something like that can read that, they can think, I can't do anything. I can't even charge my phone. And it leads to that kind of like resignation mm -hmm. in a weird way. Um, so, yeah, it, it's about understanding like where you're probably going to be compromised is like it's definitely going to be some an email you clicked on or it's going to be, you know, a, a, a password you reuse. It's not going to prioritize probably, properly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, folks, uh, if you have a thought about this or anything we talk about on the show, send us an email feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Jeffrey Hinton was born at Wimbledon, graduated King's College, Cambridge in 1970, got an experimental psychology degree, worked on some of the most important algorithms used in neural networks, and won a Turing Award. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton it looms large in the history of the development of what we call AI. He teaches at the University of Toronto now, and in 2013, Google bought his research company. You probably heard about that research company. They're the ones that made AlexNet. In 2012, AlexNet got a lot of attention as the neural network that could recognize cats and dogs and flowers. Seems kind of quaint now, given what we can do, but it was a big deal at the time. It was pivotal in Google's development of transformers. That's the T in GPT, and that led to Google Bard, ChatGPT, and more. Hinton just left Google Monday in order to, in his words, freely speak about the risks of AI without having to consider how his comments will or won't affect Google. Now, Hinton says he believes Google has acted very responsibly, but he told the New York Times that the competition between Bing's chatbot and Google's Bard has him worried. The intense competition might cause the companies to disregard consequences and lead to a world where nobody will be able to tell what's true anymore. And longer term, he fears that AI could eliminate jobs and possibly the need for humanity itself as AI can write and run its own code. Yeah, he also told the New York Times that he thinks scientists should be working just as hard on ways to control AI, saying, I don't think they should scale this up more until uh, more until they have understood whether they can control it. So this is a pretty you know large, looming, respected voice in AI that's sounding a little worried. Is this the time we pay attention to this type of warning? Chris, is, is this like like is, are, is your radar up? My radar is definitely up and it's up all over the place because uh, when I see something like this, my first uh, inclination is to challenge the person and saying, OK, you're the one who helped invent this. So while you invented this, you never saw any of these possibilities as a thing. You just saw it now when it's at, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. But then, I, I've got, I can I can address that. If oh, you want. Yeah. I've got Go an ahead. idea. Yeah, absolutely. On that. Because of because of what are the, some of the things that he said here is that I thought it was progressing too slowly. He he says yes. I always knew there would be risks, and he's not saying we should stop developing it. He's mm -hmm. saying we should develop for the consequences. But it is recently that he has noticed that something he thought, and I, he says this in his interview with the New York Times, something he thought was twenty or thirty years down the road has become closer. So it's not that he didn't know the risks. He thought the risks were worthwhile, that they could guard against them, and they were coming farther down the road. And now he's worried that the risks are happening faster than he expected and at a time when nobody is paying attention to the consequences. Is this I, – I have a question about this because is this – Hinton, he is an academic. Like that is his background. Entrepreneur, sure, has started companies and stuff like that, but he is an academic. So his interest is in 
advancing the science of this, right? And his problem is the kind of the rubber meeting the road here, right? Is is the competition and the result of this technology operating where uh, people are rapidly trying to productize that? Like, does that explain any of of his kind of like does does that I guess diminish his worry about that or is that like surprising that someone who is supremely smart I guess like is kind of realizing the the effects of this market competition at this point yeah so that's a great question so essentially they're asking is it, what is that a valid motivation is his motivations pure I, I think and when I started uh, going through his uh, what he was saying and what he was uh, repeating and some of his history it kind of led me to give him the credibility, at least up front. You know, one, he was offered uh, a job or to take money from the DOD to send his technology to them. He turned it down, which mm-hmm. a lot of people wouldn't have done. And he says he does not believe in using AI for war, war machines. So I, I was like, OK, you know, game on. And then on top of that, he had a ton of comments. He held his comments as to not have them hindered by having to worry about how they would affect Google, which I thought is also an honorable thing to do. So when I put those two pieces together, I I think he's pretty honorable in his worries. Now, you know, is he overreacting? I I don't know. But I, I like the fact that the guy that invented it is actually concerned and putting those concerns out publicly instead of behind the scenes. Yeah, I I think it, I mean, he's also 75. So at a certain point he may realize, you know what, it's better for me to get on the record now uh, than to spend the rest of my life in silence. And, and there's plenty of younger minds that are doing great things that can pick up, you know, pick up the baton. Now I don't feel like I'm leaving uh, the discipline in the lurch because again, he's, He's saying, look at how it was five years ago and how it is now. Take the difference and propagate it forwards. That's scary. Right. I, that is, as I get older, I realize that you start to think like, oh, I don't have a whole lot of time left uh, and and things are moving faster than I, when I was young kind of attitude. The counter to that is what OpenAI's uh, uh, Sam Altman has been saying, which is we're about to hit a plateau. It won't keep getting better at the same rate that it has sure. been get, getting better. Uh, and, and so, I, you know, I'm not saying one of them is right and one of them is wrong. Again, because I think what he is doing here, what, what Hinton is doing here is not saying let's stop. He's saying we need to be working on how to counter this stuff. Right. We we should not be stopping working on it, but we shouldn't only be pushing it forward. We should also be working on the safeguards at the same time. And that's what he's not seeing enough of. And well, from and- that aspect alone, I find that that's uh, extremely important. And only for the fact that we do not have a great history of our uh, politicians regulating technology properly. Right. In fact, we watch some of these interviews and it's clear they have no idea what they're what they're seeing and what's going on and and how to talk about it so you know raising these type of alarms and you know and to you know microsoft and google's credit they have started putting out there and saying hey you guys need to regulate this stuff so to their credit you know i i think it it, it is a positive thing overall to start you know getting people aware that we should start looking at this I think it's significant that Hinton didn't sign either of those letters warning of the risk. Now, he was still at Google at the time. Yes. But he he is taking a more nuanced approach to this. And he he could have come out in this interview. Like, if he wanted to be like, I wanted to sign on to it, I didn't. Because he could have very easily have said that. I do wonder, Tom, to your point of, you know, kind of uh, of reaching a point in your career and in your life and and kind of looking back at it. I do wonder if this is... A realization, obviously, AI development, like this, uh, like tons of money in this for years now at this point. He's certainly obviously aware of that. But kind of this idea of this specific generative AI going from going to almost kind of like a multi multi multimodal kind mm-hmm. of, uh, 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 of, of arrangement, right, where he he was at the forefront of this. He was the leader in this for decades, right? Like like at the f- absolute forefront, bleeding edge. And not to say that Google is not still there, but that there are now numerous other parties. And it's one thing when you're at the bleeding edge and you are leading it and you realize like, I have a grasp of what I think are the moral implications of this or, or whatever. And then to realize I am dealing now with not just other researchers, but other companies 
uh, that have you know agendas that I don't know about. He's very clear to say Google has been a, a good steward uh, of of AI up until this point, up until I'm leaving the company, basically. Uh, and and but there there it's not just Google, right? So I, I Ken Warfo Four has a good way of putting it. You should know how to stop the train you started. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Speaking of the hype train, two two. Nice, nice one. Yeah, <laughs> two two. All right. Well, late last month, the journal Publications of the National Academy of Sciences, one of my favorite of the publications, published a paper detailing the world's first wooden transistor. Don't take wooden nickels, but you can accept a wooden transistor. It was created by researchers at the Wallenberg Wood Science Center in Stockholm, Sweden. The researchers created conductive channels inside the pores of balsa wood and used a penetrating electrolyte to modulate its conductivity. Now, don't expect to see this in a laptop with turbo boost clocks anytime soon. It's 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 pretty big. It's about three centimeters across and switches at less than one hertz as opposed to like you know, gigahertz. This being though a proof of principle design, the researchers do say smaller transistors with higher currents should be possible, you know, and it could find uses in simple things like on off switches for solar cells or sensors. And it could be incorporated into wood products, living plants, some, you know, like biodegradable tech uh, might be a lot more feasible with wooden transistors. Yeah. Oh, it's some stuff that could look nicer too, you know, yeah. you know mm -hmm. uh, home security stuff, transistors that are wood could i don't i don't know if they'll they'll get this fast enough to be able to do anything like that but it, it's certainly interesting that they can do it at all and i think that's what this paper is about right yeah you know what if i can get a better pepper out of my garden then i'm all for it now i just want ikea to make one like that looks mid-century modern and that would be perfect <laughs> Yeah, and they will. All right, let's check out the mailbag. <laughs> yeah, Matt Bat wrote in regarding the story that GM is ending its Chevy Bolt line. He wrote in and said, the good news is that there isn't much that breaks on an EV. So in a few years, hopefully the people who are looking for a commuter EV instead of an ego stroker will be able to buy a, quote, unfashionable old EV at an affordable price. And he says an internal combustion engine is a Rube Goldberg monstrosity in comparison to the simplicity of an EV. This is a great, this is a great point. Uh, if you are someone who wants a more affordable electric vehicle, you might be looking for a used Chevy Bolt. Although I don't know, the prices might be up since they don't make them anymore. And I will say, at least anecdotally, my brother owns a Bolt and my Uber driver on the way home from CES picked me up in a Bolt. And they both complained that not the EV stuff, but that the like GM car components are very specific to that car and supply has been an issue. Now we've been a supply chain hellscape. So, you know, uh, uh, full content context there, but you know, going out of production, what feels like maybe a little short, maybe uh, uh, for that kind of stuff might be hard to find components going down the road. We don't know. Yeah. The, the good news is, you know, they have the truck coming out uh, soon. Uh, they have the uh, Equinox come out yeah. as well. The Equinox looks pretty awesome. Um, yeah. From what I've seen so far in the early picture. So it's not, you know, I'm okay with them dropping the bolt. If, That's because you, know, you drive a going. truck, though. We went, <laughs> What about a sedan driver's Chris? <laughs> Free charging. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer to everything. Free charging. Uh, mic drop. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Chris Ashley, for being with us. Of, of course, as always, uh, let the folks know what you have got going on these days. Yo, come check me out on Barbecue and Tech, especially this week, because we had uh, an awesome interview with a young fella who started a food barbecue food truck with his uh, family. And uh, just the ins and outs of how they got started and some of the challenges they go through to make that happen. So, yeah, check, definitely check out this episode. It was really, really cool. And a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that episode, uh, partly because of eaten at a bunch of food trucks and it would just kind of open my eyes to what goes into making them and, and why you make them and stuff It's an excellent excellent episode well done. thank you thank you we had a lot of fun doing that one well we are dancing for joy because we have a stately quadrille of new bosses to thank here on monday that's right lewis ryan conrad and justin all joined the patron ranks they started backing us on patreon so get on your dancing shoes and thank uh lewis ryan conrad and justin you rock Woo! wow we got four over the weekend there were only three days mm. i don't know the what y'all said out. on friday Double but up. yeah well done <laughs> 
<laughs> all right. Uh, those four people are now patrons. All the rest of the patrons are going to welcome them into the club. Big, you know, pats on the back and smiles. And they get the extended show. They get the longer version. Good day, Internet where today we're going to talk about the fall of paparazzi, yet another authentic social network that is closing shop. And we're going to talk about whether we're finding out that maybe people really don't like authenticity as much mm. as they say they do. And your weekend, right? <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about what I ate on Friday. Yes, yes. <laughs> or Saturday. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, remember, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow talking about a black innovator in the AI space with Nika Montford. I can't wait. We'll see you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>